Uh, just a heads up for the next two weeks, we're going to be uh, working our way through a, a video that um, talks about the Star of Bethlehem. And uh, very, you won't hear this anywhere else. Uh, the, the guy's research is really quite deep uh, and impressive and adds to the depth and the wonder of uh, how God declared his glory and his purposes in the stars before the world began. He timed it all. Anyway, more about that over the next couple of weeks. And the Sunday after that is Christmas Day. And again, uh, you're all invited to come here for a Christmas service that day. Uh, and then we're having lunch at our home in Mont Albert, and you're more than welcome to come. Bring a friend if you really want to. Just let us know. But the key words there are, let us know, all right? So that we either cook up a banquet or a, or a feast, one of the two, all right? But uh, So we'll be asking you to respond to us uh, or by next week or certainly the week after so we have a clear idea. Okay, praise God. Well, we're here to continue walking through 2 Timothy. And at first, I'm take a pa- going to take a pa- passage this big. And the more I studied it, I thought, no, 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 we'll chop that bit off. And no, 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 too much stuff here, we'll chop that off. So I've reduced it to just this paragraph or so uh, to, to fit it into our time together. And it's about the relationship between truth and godliness. And the more I thought about it, the more scripture the Lord brought to mind. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So the first verse, verse 16 says, Avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. You look at that, we talked a bit about that last week. Um, To start arguing small points here or there, um, we get way off track. And uh, that was happening here. And uh, Paul was saying to Timothy, well, don't get caught up in those silly arguments. The kind of talk spreads like cancer. The word is actually gangrene, okay? As in the case of Hymenius and Philetus, uh, they have left the path of truth, claiming that the resurrection of the dead has already occurred in this way. They've turned some people away from the faith. Can you imagine, you're looking forward to the resurrection, the day when, when Christ returns, and the Lord will be caught up to meet him in the air. How wonderful. And these guys are saying, well, it's already happened. You've missed out. Well, for people who are not solid in the faith, that would have been very distressing news. And so these guys are spreading these sort of uh, ugly, ugly stories. Uh, that were not true. And not only were they being led astray, but they were leading others astray as well. But the point is that foolish talk leads to godlessness. By the same token, we'll see truth leads to godliness, godly living. So I wrote there, beware of any new teaching. You know, Timothy, Paul says to Timothy later, the days are coming when people are not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they're going to accumulate teachers to suit their own likings. They'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. Okay? And uh, the first example that came to my mind was health and wealth. You now, there's a branch of the church that says, you know, come to Jesus, God will bless you. And uh, bed of roses, he promises to bless you. The abundant life, and they put it in terms of health and wealth. And uh, that's just not true. God never promised that. Abundant life, yes, but a big bank balance, they're not the same thing. All right? So teachers in their quest to say something new and different usually end up straying from the truth. As I like to say, nothing I say is original. I've heard it from somewhere else before, except I've never heard anyone else say nothing I say is original. So maybe that's original. All right? Hope you're impressed. Great. So, so I want to talk about truth and godliness. And the first thought that came to my, my, my mind was, it all started in the garden. There's Adam and Eve in perfect relationship with each other and with God. Now, the serpent, Satan, was more subtle 
and any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. Subtle means tricky. And he said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Now, Satan knew that's not what God said. But he's sort of ter- stirring the pot, teasing, trying to get her off balance. And that's been Satan's key line ever since. Did God say this? Nah, you know, you, you got the message wrong. He said something else, okay? But Eve at least stood up for herself. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of of the trees of the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So she remembered. So Satan tried being subtle and tricky, and that didn't work. So he then tries a direct approach. He says, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. Come on. You don't even know what die means yet. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing both knowing good and evil. Wow. To be like, to be more like God, how wonderful is that? But see, I wrote there, John 8, Jesus calls Satan the father of lies. You will not die. God is trying to shortchange you. He's trying to limit you. He's bluffing. You'll never, never know if you never have a go. Come on, Eve. You can do it. And we know the rest of the story. It looked good. It tasted good. And the pride of life that I would be like God would make me feel good. Well, that's it. They bought the lie and sin came into the world and godliness or godlike, Christ-like behavior was no longer possible. A few chapters later, Genesis 6, God says, I regret that I made man. It was a mistake. Their hearts are on evil always. If you listen to the lie... You'll stray away from God. And we're going to see, Paul is saying, if you listen to the truth, you'll come closer to God. So Titus 1.1, 1, 1, uh, he declares his purpose in writing the book. This letter is from Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I've been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. If we feed our hearts and our minds on the truth, well, where do we get that? We will live, we're much more inclined, we're likely to live godly lives. But if we don't listen to the truth, we just follow our own hearts, yeah, it's a downward slide. Okay? So truth is required for godliness. Now, I remember hearing years ago, there are three Influences that stop me from living a godly life. There's Satan, of course, trying to derail us. The world, Vanity Fair, saying, Ooh, you ought to be more like this or more like that. And then there's the flesh, the own voice within me, my fallen voice that uh, listens to all that and is attracted to that. You know, I have never been tempted to smoke, not once. Why? Because, well, my uncle did something to me once when I was a kid. He had tried this and he, he went, and now came the smoke. I was about six or seven, and I copped my lungs out. And right, there's no interest or desire to smoke. So Satan says, well, I won't try that on cost, so there's just no point. It doesn't match a desire within but Satan knows us well enough to know where our weak points are. And that's where he tempts us. Okay? So anyway, that was actually a digression. Here we go. Our moral compass is unreliable. 
Hebrews 3.13. But exhort one another, <coughs> excuse me, every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is tricky. And we are prone to be deceived. And as I wrote there, a comment I said about myself about a decade ago, sin makes you stupid. Because the sin makes you stupid. Stop it. You're making some dumb choices here. Our moral compass is unreliable. More about that. Huh. The compass, the heart. Jeremiah 17, 9. I've got it in two versions here. RSV. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately corrupt. Who can understand it? The New Living Translation says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? So I found this diagram. Follow your heart, son. Follow your heart. Okay, heart, what'll it be? And the heart says, sin. And the boy says, yes. Follow your heart seems such wise counsel. But how often have you followed your heart and did what, if it feels right, do it. And uh, oh, later you knew that that was a bad choice. Regrets, I've had a few. Okay. I hate to say this, your heart, your conscience is not a reliable guide. I had a friend of mine would say, it's like your conscience is not enough. It's like a rifle and the sniper, you know, the, what are they called? The things in the rifle, the scope, yeah? You've got to connect this part of the scope with the thing at the end of the rifle. When they are in line, then you know you shoot what you're shooting at. Okay? If you just look at one thing alone, you don't really know where the gun is pointing. You've got to line up your conscience with the scriptures, then you shoot straight. So we need to educate our conscience, our mind, our values, our convictions. Because our heart alone, our conscience alone, uh, will be our undoing will often be our undoing. And it made me think of this passage, the escalating consequences of sin. 1 John chapter 1. I'll pick verse 6, 8, and 10. Verse 6 says, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie to others and do not live according to the truth. Yet, yeah, no problems, I'm well, how are you? You know, I'm not being honest with you yet. Yeah? Or uh, the, the hypocrite's mask. Uh, the face on Sunday doesn't match the face Monday to Friday. Well, you know, there's something wrong there. I'm lying about my true nature. And then a couple of verses later, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, not just others. Now I'm fooling myself. And the truth is not in us. And that is possible, to deceive yourself. Yeah, I'm okay. And then verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now I'm saying, no, God, I don't know what your problem is. I don't need Jesus. I don't need the cross. You know, if you have a problem with me as I am, well, you know, that's your problem, God, not mine. I don't need a saviour. Now we're saying God is the one who's misreading the situation. Now I'm saying he's the liar. Do you see the escalation? I'm fooling others, fooling myself. Now I'm saying that God is the one who's in the wrong. That's the downward you know, cascading into corruption and to denying the truth because, well, we love our sin too much to acknowledge that the truth is what it is. Yeah. Satan is the, isn't he called the deceiver of this world? He's certainly called the God of this world. 
He's also called the great deceiver. The whole world is deceived. We were once deceived. And God, by his grace, has pulled us back through the word, through the spirit, etc. Okay. You see, you can fool yourself, but you can't fool God. Nuts. I hate that. Don't you? Galatians 6, 7 and 8. Don't be deceived. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. You reap what you sow. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Am I sowing to the flesh and all of its desires, if it feels good, do it? Or am I sowing to the Spirit? God knows my heart. He says, Costa, is that really the most important thing to you right now? You really want to do that? Okay, sunshine, do it. I'll wait for you when you wake up to yourself and you come back and apologize. He is faithful and just. He will forgive me. One of those verses back in 1 John. But I'm wasting all this time in the gutter instead of staying on the highway. You know? Um... Yeah, in 1 John, uh, those who know him do not sin. Well, they contradict something said. You've got to admit that you've sinned. Uh, the Greek tension that we do not sin, it's not our constant predisposition and practice to sin, sin, sin. If that's the case, you're not really a child of God. But we're all going to stumble. See, I was a pig and I loved the mud of sin. Wallow, wallow, wallow. But when I became a sheep... A sheep can fall into the mud, but it says, Ugh, I want out of here. That's the new nature that we have, that God has given us to make us more like Christ. So, this thing about, so, you know, I talk about the omnipresence of God. When I talk about the attributes of God, I always finish it with a, there's a wow, and there's an ouch. God is with me always. Wow. Even when I feel in danger or alone, he is there. God is with me always. Ouch. There are times I wish he'd leave the room. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. So live in the presence of God. Yeah. And so to the spirit, not the flesh. Now, how does sin deceive us? I found that picture. Isn't that a beautiful looking fish? It's a lure. Why do they call it a lure? Because the fish is a, oh, yeah, breakfast. Yeah? But the lure conceals the hook. And once the fish bites the lure, Great. He's also bitten into the hook and it's caught. Satan does the same thing with us. Now, thought of Proverbs 20, verse 17. Bread gained by deceit tastes sweet to a man. But afterwards, his mouth will be full of gravel, rocks, stone. Tastes good for a little while, but later, oh, deep regrets. And Satan always does that. He lures you. Hey, you really want this? This will be fun. This will be worthwhile. No one will know. You take the bite. You feel guilty. And Satan says, aha, gotcha. Now, thank God our failure is never final. But when you know you made a stupid choice, well, thank God for the cross. I come back and, Lord, stupid man that I am. Francis of Assisi, Assisi referred to his body as brother ass. This jackass of a body of mine and its habits and its attractions to the wrong things. Well, I think in the next slide we talk about a shocking biblical example. 
Sorry if it's a bit extreme. Amnon was one of the sons of David, King David. David had lots of sons and daughters, lots of wives. And one of his daughters, David's daughters from another mother, was Tamar, and she was beautiful. And Amnon was totally besotted with Tamar. I want her, I want her. And his mate said, listen, why don't you pretend that you're sick and ask for Tamar to come and look after you? Oh, yeah, happily, my brother. So she goes. And then he says, come to bed with me. Lie with me. She says, no way, no, no, this isn't right. Ask the king. He'll, he won't withhold you as your bride. But Amnon wouldn't listen to her, Tamar. And since he was stronger than she was, he raped her. He got what he wanted. Look at the next verse. Then suddenly Amnon's love turned to hate. And he hated her even more than he had loved her. Get out of here, he snarled at her. And she leaves the room distressed and Tamar's brother Absalom gets revenge on this guy a couple of years later. And all this conflict has now entered King David's family between his sons and daughters. I want it. Got to have it at any cost. And now that I've had it, it all went horribly sour. Yeah? I thought I loved it. Now I hate her. And I'll blame her for my sin. I mean, that's the way, isn't it? Adam, what have you done? Oh, the woman. <laughs> she ate first. Eve, what have you done? Oh, the serpent. He told me. You know, we never accept responsibility for our own behavior. We always want to blame someone else. Um, as a way of wriggling off the hook to keep that example going. And we try to justify our behavior. But again, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. He knows. He knows. So yeah, we sin, we fail, and we hurt others. We hurt ourselves. And we hurt our relationship with God. And everybody's suffering. That's a picture of our world. Because our world is not in tune with the truth. Which puts some spine into our, like a backbone to stand up against sin and temptation. Yeah, extreme example. Well, how am I going to find truth? Well, the first and obvious reference is Jesus is the truth. John 1, so the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. Now, I grew up with full of grace and truth in my version of the Bible. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. A few verses later, for the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness, his grace and truth, came through Jesus Christ. It wasn't just truth, I'm going to nail you to the wall, which he could have, but it came with grace and love. If you looked hard enough for that in the law of Moses, maybe you'll see snippets of it, but it wasn't the main message. Okay. Grace and truth came through Jesus. Then Jesus then said, uh, later on in John chapter 8, he said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. Again, RSV, if you continue in my word, you're truly my disciples. You know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Free from what? Well, his listeners weren't impressed. We're descendants of Abraham, they said. We've never been slaves to anyone. Very short memories, Babylon and so on. But anyway, what do you mean you'll be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. I remember hearing a poem years ago, a girl at Campbell Baps. 
you ain't smoking them cigarettes. Them cigarettes is smoking you. Sin is that. You have a habit, you think you're in control. No, that habit is in control of you. So if the sun sets you free, you are truly free. Jesus says you are bound to sin, you're a slave to sin. And a slave can't free himself. But Jesus said, I will set you free. How? If you continue in my word, you'll know the truth. And the truth will set you free from the lies that distort your thinking, that lead you astray. That's why I need the scriptures. To get my thoughts in line with his thoughts, then I'm shooting straight. Continue in my word. Jesus said later in John chapter 7, John 17, the great high priestly prayer, make them holy by thy truth, in your truth. Sanctify them in your truth. Thy word, your word is truth. So there's Jesus saying of the scripture, this is truth. Lord, use that truth, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, to sanctify, to set apart, to make clean your people. Here's how Peter talks about it in 2 Peter chapter 1. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have it all. There's no excuse. We have the Holy Spirit. What was new? See, before I became a Christian, I knew what sin was, but I couldn't stop doing it. And I loved sin. Once I became a Christian, uh, sin didn't feel the same anymore. More. And I wanted to stop. But what, now I've had periods like that before I became a Christian. But the difference was now I could say no <laughs> to sin. I had the Holy Spirit. And more than that, we have received all this by coming to know him, a relationship with Jesus. I tried many times to stop swearing New Year's Eve resolutions and uh, didn't last long. When I became a Christian, I remember the first time I swore when I missed the tram. <sighs> I felt like I'd offended my best friend. Lord, I'm sorry. Wash my mouth out, please. And he did. I'm not claiming a perfect record since then. My wife will know. No. Driving can bring out the worst in a person's vocab. However, I'll take that back. Just so I'm not pretending I'm perfect, all right? Okay. I received that by coming to know him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvellous glory and excellence. So he's called me into a relationship with him. He's now that new voice that says, no, I, I don't want to live like that. That offends you. I'm sorry, Father. And look at the next verse. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature. God gives you the promises and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Everyone does what they want and, uh, you know, um, that one lump of sugar that they won't leave each other alone, the ants squabble over limited resources, so do the Russians and the U Ukrainians and everyone else on the planet, okay? Uh, the Americans will make friends with the Saudis because they have the oil that's cheap. I mean, you know, it's all the squabble for possessions and power. Human heart, what causes conflicts and fights among you? You, have, you, you want, but you don't have. That's what causes the fights. <coughs> However, my point from this verse is God has given you promises to enable you to resist, to escape sin. I think I shared here recently, I feel like I have, when uh, uh, at a Mux camp, there was a girl that 
you know, was clearly happy for me to kiss her. And the Spirit sends a telegram. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, no temptation is overtaken that is not common to man. God is faithful and you'll not let you be tempted beyond your strength. But with the temptation will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That's how slowly the voice spoke to me. And I'm sure this girl is going, hello, anybody home? I was listening to God. This word that I've memorized that he put into my heart and brought to my mind. And I excused myself and just got out of the room as quickly as I could. The word of God used to keep, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to thy word. I've laid up thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You know, God uses his word to keep us holy, to keep us from sin. Another reason to get into the scriptures and claim the promises. Well, I think I had another example. Yeah, a story here. Don't read the verse, look at me. Mia and I split up for a year to work out God's will if we were right for each other. When we were going together, before we were married. Oh, sorry, yeah, darling, yeah. <laughs> and we split up for a year to discern God's will. And I'm studying at the Bayview Library, and I look up, and there she is walking past one of the shelves. Oh, every bone in my body wanted to track her down. How are you going? But I knew I couldn't and shouldn't. I was going to a cell group in about half an hour's time in the old arts building. And um, I went to the room early and I, just, I was just so upset. I was just crying my eyes out. And I threw, I literally just took my RSV Bible, opened it up. And these are the first verses that my eyes laid upon. No joke. Telegram. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that in faithfulness thou hast afflicted me. Yep, I felt afflicted, you know, and it was God's will for us to separate, and uh, God is faithful, even though it was hard. Let thy steadfast love be ready to comfort me, according to thy promise to thy servant. Lord, you promised you would see me through this. Please now, Lord, comfort me. I didn't stop crying straight away, but the nature of the tears changed as I felt God's presence and comfort and assurance. He uses his word to minister to our hearts. It took me about a minute to memorize those two verses because they were just the right message at the right time. Again, just got incidents as I opened my Bible. He sent a telegram. I hope and trust that each of you have experiences like that from the Lord when you know yeah, that he is speaking to you directly. Okay, back to 2 Timothy. <laughs> but God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone. With this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his, just as he knows those false teachers who are not his, okay? Timothy, you are his. God knows it and he'll keep you. And he quotes another verse, all who belong to the Lord must turn away from evil. Timothy, don't argue with them. Don't debate with them. Just turn away from evil. More about that in the coming uh, sermon, okay? Had to chop it off before this. So in verse 20, he, he, Paul picks up on this turn away from evil, and he gives an example. In a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions and the cheap ones are for everyday use. I'm going to ask you some questions. Would you rather be made of gold and silver 
or just uh, you know wood and clay. Gold and silver sounds so much more glamorous, doesn't it? Sure. But how often do you pull out the gold and silver and the good crystal? Maybe for Christmas lunch? That's about it. But the, um, not called Arca Rock, what are those plates called? Arca Rock plates, you know? You drop them from a great height, they don't break. You know, they're great. They're great for the kids, they're light, they're easy to clean. You use those every day. Which would you rather be? Sitting in the crystal cabinet waiting for Christmas Day or everyday use? I'd rather everyday use, I'll be honest with you. I want to be useful. Here's an example. Me and I were newly wed and there was a couple, the Sayers, and they came and they talked to us. I'm not sure who we were visiting in hospital. We saw them in hospital. And they said, well, we got these wedding gifts, you know. You get towels, his and her towels. You think, oh, thank you very much, lovely. And you get this great towel sanitizer deodorizer. Oh, wow, what a wonderful gift. The reality, how often was this thing used? Once, twice, then gathers dust at the bottom of the cupboard. And the towels you're reusing every week, you know, you use the towel, you wash the towel, you use it again. I'd rather be a towel than a towel deodorizer in the kingdom of God. Really. Um, everyday use. Any time use. Now, I'm not sure if that's what Paul had in mind, but that's certainly what comes to my mind, okay? All right. The next verse, he says something like it. He says, now look at that glass. Don't read the verse. Look at that glass. If I offered that to you right now, would you drink it? I don't think so. And warning about our water at the moment, it's coming out blue. Don't drink water from the tap. We'll have to say, listen, get someone in to fix it because it's just, I'm not even inclined to taste it. You know? So. We serve Sorry? Uh, in the sanitizer tub, it is being filtered, okay, so you can drink that, great, okay. But that filter is working overtime, I'm just telling you. If you keep yourself pure, you'll be a special utensil for honourable use. Your life will be clean and you'll be ready for the master to use for every good work. And I've said this before, if you had a filthy crystal glass and a clean plastic tumbler and you're dying for a drink, I know which one you go for. Give me the clean plastic anytime rather than the filthy crystal. Our lives need to be clean for, for the master to use us. You see, An example, I mean, I've been a, a soccer tragic, excuse me. But, you know, if I'm watching the soccer and the phone calls and, and, and someone sends me a message and needs a reply, I've got a choice to make. And uh, to my shame, uh, not now, soccer, okay? I've made a choice where I put that first. Or if my mind is in the gutter, the Lord will be saying, Telegram! And I won't hear him. Costa, I want you to do something for me. Watch it. He says, Costa, you're not even on the bench in my, in my team. I want you to come play on the court. You're not even on the bench. You, you're sitting in the crowd doing something different. You're not available for use. Remember I said faithful, te fa fat Christians, faithful, available, teachable. Being clean and ready is part of available. Lord, here I am. Any time, anything, anywhere, what do you want me to do? That's what he's telling Timothy to do. Okay. So his final word to Timothy today, run. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, pursue righteousness, righteous living, 
faithfulness, love and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Don't hang out with the wrong crowd. Hang out with the right crowd, those who love the Lord, because a bad company ruins good morals. Uh, I, I thought of Psalm 84, verse 10. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Okay. Sure, I could be partying it up some New Year's Eve and there's grog and there's women and who knows what else there might be. But if I had a choice of that and the people of God, the psalmist says, I'd rather be in the house of God with the people of God than where the big party's happening. Run, flee youthful lusts. And of course, the classic example in the Old Testament of that one is Joseph, Potiphar's wife. Joseph was their um, servant and Potiphar's wife was attracted to him. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come and sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. He didn't say, pardon me, Mrs. Potiphar, let's talk about this rationally, you know. Da -da -da -da. And he didn't sit down and debate about it and try and reason with her. Uh, the only thing was, just get out of there, mate. Get out of there. As I had to with that girl back at the Mux camp. Uh, have you heard of Don't, don't Argue? It, it's, it's an old uh, Hutton's ham. Don't argue, and the guy's pushing the other person away. It's a famous old advertising symbol. Don't argue. So I'm doing that. So in the footy commentary, uh, you know, I'm running to get away from it. I put up the, the hand. It's a, like, oh, it's a don't argue, all right? Don't argue with sin. Just, just get out of there. Okay. Um, I'll play with the fire, but I won't get burnt. That's the lie, isn't it? I'll play with the fire, but I won't get burnt this time. It's a lie. Come on. Don't argue, just run. Okay, well, I think I'm going to close with Don't Therefore My Beloved Brethren and a song. Um, so I say, don't aspire to be happy. That's what the American Bill of Rights, uh, uh, our number one right, the pursuit of happiness. No, aspire to be holy. That's the key to true happiness anyway. Two, don't just listen to your three enemies, Satan, the word, the flesh, our old nature, but taking God's word, the truth, to clarify our thinking, to set us with the right perspective toward God, toward other people, towards ourselves, towards sin. If sin wasn't serious and horrible, Jesus would never have gone to the cross for us. Now, I thought of this song from my old, old past, and so I'm going to ask uh, this YouTube to be played. We're just going to sing the first three verses of it. I think it's an appropriate response, and I hope it's from your heart and mine. Search me, O God, and my heart.
Father, we thank you. What an incredible privilege we have that the temple of God is no longer in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, but in our bodies. We are the temple of God. You live in us. Father, what a privilege. May we desire to live lives worthy of our calling, to live lives that are really pleasing to you and Christ-like more and more in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, in obedience to you, in purity. Lord, none of us are perfect. We're never going to be perfect this side of eternity. But Lord, we want to be heading in the right direction in our walk with you. Father, help us desire to take some verses that motivate us to live lives that are pleasing to you, to set them in our hearts, and uh, Lord, that you would use them to help us to walk in a way that is pleasing to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.